You're listening to What Happened to Nelson Mandela's South Africa, a three-part series that we're running through the Conversation Weekly channel, marking 30 years of democracy in post-apartheid South Africa. Mr. Mandela mounts the steps into the into the amphitheatre. It's the 10th of May, 1994. Nelson Mandela is giving his inaugural address in Pretoria as South Africa's first democratically elected president. 4,000 people are there watching, including heads of state from around the world, as Mandela takes the oath of office. I, Nelson Rodesasa Mandela, do hereby swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. This moment marked a major departure from the oppressive years of the apartheid regime, where the country's white minority had ruled the nation and marginalized South Africa's black majority for almost five decades. In his speech, Mandela acknowledged the deep scars left by apartheid, but he appealed to South Africans to heal the wounds of the past and create a new path of unity for the future. We must therefore act together as a united people for national reconciliation, for nation building, for the birth of a new world. In this special series, we'll be exploring what has happened to Nelson Mandela's South Africa as the country marks three decades of post-apartheid democracy. I'm Gemma Ware, host of The Conversation Weekly, and I'm delighted to be joined for this series by my colleague Tabul Shilo, politics editor at The Conversation based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Hi, Tabo. Hi, Gemma. So, Tabo, tell me, what were you doing when Mandela was elected in this important moment for South Africa? I was a business reporter and I volunteered to cover the election in what was then called Northern Transvaal, today called Limpopo. And it was a moment of excitement and, and anxiety as well, because the elections were not really smooth and things were not really going according to plan 100%, but... We ended up having a credible election. So you were in Limpopo for the actual election. Were you there when Mandela was inaugurated? Yeah, it was a culmination of a very long, difficult period and something that I never thought would happen in my lifetime. I was still believing that we are going to defeat the apartheid regime militarily. That wasn't to be. And the ANC won of all the liberation movements. It got the biggest share of the vote and it formed the government. When you think back at that moment there, standing watching Mandela being sworn in in the union buildings, what do you feel? The significance of the moment wasn't lost on me. And I started looking to the future and will this really last? And will those racist white people that had oppressed us, will they accept this change? Because I mean, just before then, there was a lot of violence. And uh, it was just a moment of joy mixed with a kind of anxiety. And we're now living that future. It's 30 years on. And in this series, we'll be hearing a number of conversations that you're having with leading South African scholars who've been looking at what's been happening in South Africa uh, since democracy and since the post-apartheid moment. And in this episode, we'll be unpacking that initial excitement around Mandela's election, the political transition, and the challenges that were lying ahead for South Africa as it set out to define what was going to be its post-apartheid future. Before we get into these conversations you've been having for this episode, can you give us a bit of context? Can you tell us what was happening in South Africa in the years leading up to Mandela's election? I mean, I was a student, and right up to 1989, when I started working, we were engaged in fighting the apartheid regime. Little did we know that negotiations had actually started and then it, there was actually a, going to be a negotiated settlement. And there were meetings with the ANC in exile to try to smooth the path. The country was run by the National Party. This is the party that formalized apartheid in 1948. And the ANC was in exile, so were other liberation movements. A free man taking his first steps into a new South Africa. So Mandela was released in February 1990 after 27 years in prison. What happened after that leading up to the elections in 94? I think the negotiations could actually start in earnest because he had made it very clear that only free men, free people can actually negotiate. So that's why he had to be released. He came out of prison and the negotiations really started in earnest. Unfortunately, at that moment, not everyone bought into 
the process. And some people were actually willing to stop it violently. It was a period of heightened violence, especially in Johannesburg and surrounds and KwaZulu-Natal. I mean, that's why when people say this was a peaceful transition, I, I don't agree it was a peaceful transition. I mean, estimated 20,000 people lost their lives in the period. So this negotiated a supposedly peaceful settlement didn't come cheap. Around the time of the election and the preparation of the election, as you say, there was this underlying potential for violence. And that's actually come out in some of the conversations you've been having as well, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. I mean, it's not potential for violence. Actual violence was taking place. I mean, even walking around Johannesburg was very, very, very difficult. A bomb exploded, barely missing my brother. And to try to understand what was going on at that moment, I spoke to Stephen Friedman, a professor at the University of Johannesburg, who is also an expert on South African politics. I was at the time a researcher at a research institute called the Centre for Policy Studies. I then was drafted, in effect, in early 1994 into the Independent Electoral Commission to the analysis unit in the monitoring division. And, you know, I would be party to serious discussions among commissioners and so on about, you know, would we actually get to the election? Would, would the election ever actually happen? So the, the actual experience of working in the commission was incredibly challenging, I think, for everybody involved. And quite scary at times. I remember the, the commission's office moved to the middle of the Johannesburg inner city you know, I remember looking down from my office at the street where large numbers of Inkata Freedom Party members were marching in an attempt, in effect, to stop the election and sort of wondering whether they were going to storm the building or whether they were going to do anything really. Not. In the end, they didn't. It was a very stressful time, and I think anybody who, who was in the IC at the time who looks back on it as a romantically is, is, is kidding themselves. But obviously, when the election actually happened, the whole atmosphere obviously changed dramatically. The contrast between the days after the election uh, result was announced and the two or three months before couldn't have been starker. I remember going to the results announcement and it really was like moving into another world. So eventually the African National Congress, the ANC, under Nelson Mandela, went on to win these elections in 1994. What kind of organisation was the ANC at that time? You might recall it just come out of exile. And the ANC was a leader of what is called the Congress Movement. That is, it's made of organisations that espouse the same values with the African National Congress and subscribe to the Freedom Charter, which is the ANC's blueprint for a free and equal society. And they, these organizations, they in an alliance with the trade union and the South African Communist Party. But it wasn't the only liberation movement at the time at all, was it? No, it definitely it wasn't. Just to, to name a few, we had the, the Pan-Africanist Congress. They were also in exile. And it was also, importantly, the Black Consciousness Movement, which also were fighting for freedom and liberation in the country. And what is the general assessment now of the ANC's role in liberating South Africa from apartheid? The ANC no doubt played a leading role in the liberation struggle. But the impression has been created that it was the only act in town. Now, to put these matters into perspective, I wanted to learn from Stephen Friedman what he thought of this narrative. To be blunt, the ANC didn't liberate the country. A great many things happened which created the reality. And my argument throughout was that to simply say sanctions defeated apartheid or the resistance of people internally defeated apartheid was only telling part of the story because it was a combination of a variety of factors. There was huge international revulsion. Workers went on strike in 1973 in the factories in Durban, I mean, the first major strike in, in 15 years. And even the fact that, you know, there were pressures within white society pushing people to change. I mean, all of these factors combined to produce the change that we saw. And, and to reduce it to one organization is not accurate. 
as far as that organization is concerned, I'm not saying they played no role at all, but I think it was common among ANC people at the time, and I think remains part of ANC mythology, to vastly overestimate the ANC's role in internal resistance. So once the ANC under Nelson Mandela had taken over and was in these buildings of power that they'd once been struggling to, to overthrow, how did this political transition actually begin? So you have a new government that is popular and representative of society. Those aspirations, hopes and dreams were crushed and apartheid, suppressed. People were actually excluded from what the country has to offer. Now, the ANC uh, came up with uh, what was called the, the Reconstruction and Development Program to reconstruct the country and develop it for the benefit of all South Africans. Once in power, the Mandela government passed the Reconstruction and Development Program Act. What did it aim to do and uh, how significant was it? The story behind the Reconstruction and Development Programme was that in, in the months leading up to the election, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, which of course was the ANC, still is the ANC's trade union ally, became concerned that the new government, the democratic government, would simply ignore the needs of working people and of poor people and would simply pander to the rich, etc. And their solution was to hold the government to uh, a program, the Reconstruction and Development Program, which would bind it to, to do what they wanted it to do. Uh, and the result of which was a much quoted document called the Reconstruction and Development Program, which purported to do that. What happened was that there was a very strong lobby, which was really very concerned that the ANC should not upset the markets, that it should not scare away people with capital. They managed to, to, to water it down quite substantially. And the problem that created was that by the time the election happened, despite a lot of the mythology which now surrounds it, the RDP wasn't a terribly usable document, by which I mean that if you looked at the RDP document, literally, I think, two pages apart, you would read that the democratic government was going to crack down on polluters and make sure that we had a clean environment, etc. And in two ways before that, there was a whole thing on the need for industrial development and we need more smokestack industries, etc. So nobody can quite explain how you actually encourage polluters at the same time as you crack down. And there was a lot of that kind of stuff in the RDP. I understand and shall honour the obligation of confidentiality imposed upon me by any provision of the promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act. And then in 1995, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established. And its purpose was to offer a platform for people to come clean on either side of the liberation struggle. Yeah, it was led by Bishop Desmond Tutu, one of the leading lights in the fight against apartheid South Africa. So, Stephen, what role, in your view, did the Truth and Reconciliation Commission play in promoting and driving reconciliation post-apartheid? I have uh, immense respect, as I think everybody should, for the late Archbishop Tutu and for many of the people who participated in the commission. But I'm afraid that the, 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 the commission was really a, a very stark example of the symptom rather than the cure. Uh, what do I mean by that? You know, it's tried to say that by early 1990s, South Africa was a society which had been racially divided since, since 1652, basically. And that, that had to change. And one of my very strong recollections of that time, which I think is very important to us now, is that in the early 1990s in this country, there really was a sense of crisis. And I mean crisis in a very specific way. Crisis is just not people throwing up their hands and saying we have a problem. Crisis is people saying we have to change. We have to change what we do. And that was very prevalent in the early 1990s, whether it was business, whether it was academy, professions, etc. I mean, all these discussions would take place. And all of them were about race, because what else could they be about? How do you rectify black exclusion? How do you reverse the fact that, that black people have... You know, in our own country being denied everything. And my problem with the TRC is that I think that what 
in the minds of the politicians and a lot of the decision makers in this country, essentially that very difficult task, which began in the 1990s, of saying, how do we start moving, however long it takes, towards racial equality. All of that, in effect, got outsourced to the Archbishop and his assistant, the Methodist Bishop Beret. And in a sense, the elite said to, to, uh, to the Archbishop and the Bishop, you go and sort out 300 years of racial division. And it was ludicrous. I mean, even, in, uh, you know, one of the greatest South Africans we've ever produced is not going to be able uh, to reverse 300 years. And therefore it became an ab ab abdication of responsibility, uh, which was why the Archbishop himself was never satisfied with what the DRC had achieved. And he always felt that the politicians should have done an awful lot more, and he was right. All the sense of crisis, it stopped in 1994, 1995, because the response of all the decision makers was, well, we have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and not only that, we have a fine constitution which declares everybody equal. And please don't worry us with this anymore because we'd like to get on with our lives. But that ignored the fact that the real work hadn't really started. So, Tabe, what it seems to me that Stephen is saying here is that in these first few years of Mandela's presidency, there were lots of changes that were taking place, but they didn't fundamentally change the underlying structures of the South African society. I would say yes and no. It's worth remembering that the apartheid regime was not defeated through the power of the gun. The settlement we had was a negotiated settlement. And in any negotiation, there's give and take. There are compromises which have to be made. That's the, in the nature of negotiations. You don't get everything that you want. But the new government could not actually impose a lot of what initially promised that it will happen. So we've been talking a lot about kind of the policies that were implemented, some of the economic programs and the legal changes that were implemented. But a big part of the apartheid regime was the way it enforced security and the way it policed people's lives. So I imagine after 46 years of that, there was a lot of reform that needed going on to the police and the security apparatus too. Absolutely. Just think of it. I mean, during apartheid, the police force was used as a tool to help keep the white minority regime in power. It was not there to make black people feel safe. Remember, they killed so many people during the Chapel massacre. That, that exemplifies the role that they played. They killed hundreds of children during the Soweto uprisings. Now, to take that, it requires a completely new, new mentality, a major, major task. And this takes us to our next guest for this episode, Sandy Africa. Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Pretoria. I was a young woman at the time that apartheid, formal apartheid, was uh, ending. And like many of my generation at the time, apartheid was uh, making me very angry. And so I joined the uh, student movement, community organizations, political organizations. It spurred a sense of agency and of wanting to defeat it. And so I found myself involved politically. So it had the effect not of making one feel like a victim, but more like one who had a role to play in ending it. And what was your role in the ANC then? Like many people, one had multiple roles in the liberation movement. I had been, as I mentioned, a student activist from the early 80s, but was also at some time taken up into the underground structures of the ANC. Talking about underground work, I mean, maybe you should touch on the role of the police and the military during that period. What role do they play? You know, it's, it's a very interesting one because the changes happened as a result of the, the fractures that began to emerge in the late 80s between hardliners and uh, those who were more inclined uh, to a negotiated settlement. And the military and security structures of the apartheid regime were in some ways aligned with those elements. But there were also important contradictions that opened up new spaces. For example, there were people who probably would have been regarded as 
traitors because they lifted the lid on some of the worst atrocities that were happening, uh, spoke to investigative journalists and told them about the goings on within secret camps such as the notorious flat class where many people were killed. Tabo, let's just jump in here. Can you explain what Vlakplas is? Vlakplas was a farm about 20 kilometers outside Pretoria. This is where the security police would take anti-apartheid activists and would torture them, sometimes kill them, and burn their bodies there while having a barbecue, a braai, as if nothing had happened. That unit of the security police which did that came to be known as Vlakplas itself. Others who openly defied their Pretoria masters and began to side with the liberation movement in the um, so-called Bantustan at the time. So they were in disarray at the time that the changes were taking place. And I think this was one of the weak points that the liberation movement were able to exploit. Just to clarify that the Bantustans refers to the areas that black people were expected to live in and apartheid, separate from white people, where they could exercise uh, what was called self-rule in terms of apartheid master plan. What motivated you to get involved specifically uh, in the reformation of the police and security forces? The province in which I uh, grew up and lived and was active was then known as uh, Natal, now KwaZulu-Natal. This was a very violent province, one where ordinary people were caught up in the conflict between the Nkata Freedom uh, Movement and the ANC and also the UDF and other such community-based movements. I was a young academic in the early 1990s and got to witness and hear the testimonies of people who were caught up and affected by violence. And this spilled over into my scholarship and research interests. So I increasingly began looking at uh, issues of peace building, understanding the context of violence, and in fact, exploring policy options for a nonviolent society, including how the security forces um, might be restructured to serve the interests and needs of the people. The ANC had had a plan that police and other security forces would have to be reformed. And what was the vision of the ANC for for the police specifically? It was very much informed by a vision which had been adopted in the 50s at a huge gathering called the Congress of, of the People. One of the primary calls was that there should be peace and friendship To stop the bloodletting, to stop the killings, was very much what drove the ANC. And you saw it in the kind of overtures um, that uh, Mandela made, the calls that he made uh, for uh, peace and security as a foundation for building a new South Africa. And this is because violence had been so integral to upholding the apartheid system, not only the structural violence, which really is what apartheid was in the way in which it treated people as just instruments of labor to ensure that the standard of living, the privileges of the white minority were upheld, but also ensuring that this very broadly securitized society was something that became quite normalized. And South Africa before 1994 was a highly securitized, highly militarized state. It had only just recently abandoned conscription, forced conscription for white males, It had the strongest uh, defense force on the continent. It really ran roughshod over its neighbors in the region. But this began to be expensive and unsustainable. And I think South Africa's allies also saw that. Its allies in the West began to put pressure on it to come to some accommodation. So the security forces' role 
changed as the geopolitical landscape changed. And so by the time that the 1990s arrived, it began to emerge a consensus that in a democratic society, they would have to play a very different role and that was certainly not a repressive one, but one where they really protected, served as protectors of people and their rights and their interests. Of course, this was not achieved overnight and perhaps we're leapfrogging because firstly, the security forces had to be brought on board and made to accept that the sacrifices that they had made, also the thought they had made in upholding minority rule had been in vain. They had to be persuaded that there was going to be a new kind of South Africa so that they stayed out of the way, so that, in effect, politics ruled the gun and not the other way around, as had been the case. This was the time of massacres involving the police and the security forces. Would you like to touch a bit on that? There was a fear that the security forces might actually reject the changes. So if there was going to be a coup from any quarter, it would have been from that quarter. But I believe that the way in which the politics played out was that, uh, to a large extent, the enlightened forces uh, prevailed. The fears of those who thought that they had much to lose were assuaged by sunset clauses, which essentially were promises that they would have relatively soft landings, that there would be no retribution for the atrocities committed under apartheid, and that, in fact, a reconciliation would be the order of the day rather than anything else. And one of the criticisms of that uh, truth and reconciliation dispensation is that there actually have been very few prosecutions to date. And this has raised all sorts of questions about why this was so, whether, apart from the sunset clauses, there were not other secret deals that might have been made in smoke-filled rooms. And then, despite all these problems, in 1994, elections were held and Nelson Mandela was voted president. What, what was it like? Could you capture that moment? The different political organizations and parties were starting to think about how they would place their, their people in different structures. So, yes, indeed, a um, lot of excitement, but also knowing that the very next day after the election would begin the hard work of starting to rebuild and for some of us that meant moving into different roles it meant even moving homes it it meant just a whole new way of life but yes it was a moment of euphoria but knowing that the hard work was yet to come in 1994 one of the decisions were taken was to send some of the members of the ANC into political organizations and we did so voluntarily and I was lucky to be selected to head one of the institutions at a fairly senior role so I became in 1995 the head of the training facility called the Intelligence Academy and the role of this body was to train and retrain and reorientate, in fact, the post-apartheid intelligence services. And I think that we can be quite proud of the fact that the constitution that was adopted in 1996 actually came to indicate what principles should guide the security services including the intelligence services, the police, and the South African National Defence Force. And they were that South Africa basically would use its international standing to promote peace, would 
support and uphold international law, particularly international humanitarian law, that the security forces would subscribe to the rule of law, and that a very different ethos of accountability was to be established. What do you think were the most significant challenges you faced in reforming the police and other security uh, services in post-apartheid South Africa? I think, uh, you know, getting people within these security services themselves to align their conduct, their behaviours with the new ethos, with the emerging consensus about what should be the role and the posture of these forces was, I think, across the board, a very important uh, challenge. Another was getting people to trust them again. Uh, A third was that of ensuring that they were really accountable and accepted the structures of executive control, of parliamentary oversight and accountability, of judicial scrutiny and inquiry, because they had carte blanche under apartheid. And of course, the resourcing. South Africa had many different challenges at the beginning of the new dispensation. So it was very obvious that the security services would need to be reorientated, which meant retraining. But at the same time, there were other very important imperatives that the government had to attend to as well. And so the question of resourcing them was also important. There was a lot of excitement generated about the role that they would play in upholding democracy and protecting civilians and basically ensuring that people felt safe and secure. But the reality has been different. And whilst one wants to acknowledge the successes that have been there and that everywhere across these services there have been good people, there have been leaders who have really held that line. At the same time, the problem, the scourge, some would say, of corruption, of mismanagement, and indeed, from time to time, trampling on the rights of people, and particularly poor people, and sadly, particularly black people. So violence against black bodies, uh, very often easy to invoke just because of the vulnerability. And I suppose a long legacy that has not entirely been shaken off. Tabo, this conversation you've had with Sandy, it's really fascinating because it shows just how big a job it really was to reform this fundamental part of the apartheid regime, the police and security services, and that it's been a really long and, and complicated journey, that transition. Yes, and that's true for many aspects of uh, of the transition over the last 30 years in, in democratic South Africa. There was so much that needed changing. And when I spoke to Stephen, he said one important aspect of this was that the, the white minority, which controlled the, the economy, still controls the economy today, did not have to give up much. Let's try to understand this political change that, that took place with the advent of democracy. What po- political transformation would you say took place for black people? And what was it like for white people? How did things change for both? One of the more ridiculous claims you hear in the South African debate is that 1994 changed nothing. Anybody who thinks that has either totally forgotten what what, what happened before 1994 or is too young to have experienced it. it. It's simply absurd. It's very difficult for people to understand who didn't live through both periods that there was profound change. I mean, people got their dignity back. During the apartheid period, very often, in the mainstream of the society, which was entirely white. Major figures in in the black community were simply reduced to non-beings, you know. And all of that has changed. And not only that has changed, what has changed is that people can actually, they can, if they, up to a point at least, they can express themselves and they can be heard in a way which they were not heard before. So all of that, I think, is very important. 
The change for whites is one of the great ironies of pig period because a lot of white people have spent the last 30 years complaining bitterly about a change which has enhanced their living standards, enhanced their quality of life, enhanced their access to all sorts of things which they didn't have access to before because there was international isolation and Whites used to complain like mad before 1994 that they couldn't visit various places and have various experiences. So so you have this rather strange situation of of a formerly dominant group who who benefited immensely from the change. But uh, a lot of whites who have influence have just spent the last 30 years complaining about the fact that they are better off than they were in 1994. But what steps did the Mandela government take in tackling inequality and how, just how successful could you say those have been? What impact did those have? What the government strategy was is what I call in my book white privilege for everybody. You don't say that one of the problems before 1994 was that whites had too much. You ignore that. You simply say the problem before 1994 was that blacks had too little. And where that leads you is that you don't try to change the inequities. You try, in effect, to slot as many black people as possible into what served white people in the past. So to take a very obvious example, the economy. By the time 1994 happened, it used to be very commonly pointed out that five corporations controlled 90% of the shares on the Johannes Black Stock Exchange. So that obviously excluded a lot of people. And... The one way you could have gone about it is to say, well, how do we include? How do we break down the barriers of exclusion, etc.? And that's not what was done. What was done was to say, how many black people can we shoehorn into that? So black economic empowerment didn't become what the words suggest it should have become, which is how do we ensure that black people acquire real economic power? It became how many black people can we channel into positions in the corporations so that there are lots of black people on the boards and black people as CEOs, etc. And unfortunately, the answer to the question of how many people in the majority can you channel into things that were designed for 10% of the population, the sad answer is not very many because they were only designed for 10% of the population. They weren't designed for everybody. So we didn't do the spending, but but what we did is that we introduced uh, all these these programs, and that's obviously had, it's it's out of, it hasn't had no effect. We've had a significant growth of the black middle class since 1994, but it obviously excludes the majority of the population. We have still to reconcile and heal our nation to the extent that the consequences of apartheid still permeate our society. Looking back, what would you say are the enduring legacies of Nelson Mandela in the transition to democracy? Look, I mean, I know it's very easy to romanticize Mandela, etc. But I think he was hugely important. And I think he was hugely important because if you're undergoing even a difficult transition to recognizing everybody's citizenship, there's an awful lot that can go wrong. There's been a downside to to the Mandela phenomenon as well. And the downside to the Mandela phenomenon is that we spent a lot of time over the last 30 years, particularly when things got bad, really blaming the fact that the Messiah is no longer here. And when's the next Messiah coming? And that's not going to take your society forward because the next Messiah isn't coming. And if you look around the other political parties, none of them have the Messiah either. So the negative effect of the Mandela period was that instead of doing what the society really should do and saying, look, we have a series of problems here and we need to work out solutions, we've had all these diatribes about leadership, all of which are just passing the buck. And Mandela played a huge role at the time, but he's not coming back. And... As long as we expect somebody like him to come back, we remain in a courtesan. Tabo, thank you for bringing us these fascinating conversations about this key part of South African history. And we'll be getting into some more debates about the economic changes that happened in South Africa in our next episode, won't we? Yes, we'll be talking to scholars Mashub Shema Sarumule, 
and Michael Sachs and exploring what happened when Nelson Mandela stood down as president in 1999. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tabo. Everyone, do please make sure you subscribe to The Conversation Weekly so that you don't miss the next two episodes of this series. That's it for this episode of What Happened to Nelson Mandela's South Africa from The Conversation Weekly. Huge thanks for this series go to our colleagues at The Conversation in Africa, Gabby Elbaholzer, Jabulani Sekakani, Caroline Southey and Moina Spooner. This series was produced and written by Mend Marawani with production assistance from Katie Flood. I'm Gemma Ware, the show's executive producer. Our sound design was by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Saal and Alice Mason runs our social media. Stephen Kahn is The Conversation's global executive editor. You can find us on Instagram at theconversation.com or email us at podcast at theconversation.com. If you like what we do, please support our podcast and The Conversation more broadly by going to donate.theconversation.com. Thanks very much for listening. We'll see you next week. Thank you.